Hi everyone and welcome back to the Commodore room. What we've got here today is a Commodore Plus 4 that belongs to a friend of mine, Simon. And this computer doesn't work very well. And as you can see on the sticker here, it says blinking cursor, maybe it's got a bad ROM. Keyboard's pretty yellowed. I went ahead and kind of took it apart a little bit just to get an idea of what was going on inside. And here we go. Uh, one interesting thing about these computers is this, what I would say is kind of a horrible keyboard connector design, so you can kind of see it there, sort of a, just the edge of a ribbon cable, not ideal. So as I was going to test, I realized I don't have the power supply to this, so I either didn't pick it up or something, but uh, nonetheless, I don't have the power supply. These are electrically identical to the Commodore 64. It's pretty well documented on the internet. You can just pull this guy off and put a 64 power plug on there with a slight modification, and then you can use a Commodore 64 power supply. The power bricks that came with the Plus 4 are basically identical, except for the plug, to the 64 in such that it's a big epoxy filled box that tends to deteriorate over time and can fry the computer. So I want to use my modern 64 power supply so it doesn't burn this thing up. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this off and replace this with a 64 power supply so that we can test it. And I also checked with Simon, and he's totally cool with doing that because it would be more convenient for him, too. So it's a win-win for everyone. I'm going to go ahead and remove this plug using my desoldering gun. Before I had this gun, I was using solder braid and bulbs and, and all sorts of other ways of removing solder. And, wow, that was a silly mistake. It was about $270, which is why I didn't buy one initially. But, wow, this is like the best money I've ever spent. So as soon as I'm done here, this plug should just fall right off. So here we have an old 64C motherboard that I've used for parts. As you can see, I've removed a lot of things from this board over the past few years as I've needed parts that are just hard to come by. So same drill, just going to remove this plug so that we can use it in the Plus 4. So taking a look at this, it looks like the 64 power plug is just going to fit perfectly on there. I thought I had to modify one of these, but maybe not. Uh, I will clean this up a little bit. It's uh, Commodore's kind of notorious for sloppy flux cleaning and stuff like that. So let me clean this up so I can do a nice good solder job on this. With a quick glance, you'll see I've got all the flux cleaned up. I used some IPA and a toothbrush and just scrubbed it real good, let it dry. And now we'll go ahead and solder in this 64 connector so we can turn this thing on and see exactly what it's doing. All right, we've got the power supply hooked up with the new 64 connector. So let's go ahead and turn it on and see what happens. This is what we see on the screen. This is a little bit different than what Simon had described to me and what I had seen. But obviously something's not right. So we'll uh, go ahead and try a couple things here. Push on the chips, try to make sure everything is seated. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and reseat all of the chips in the PLA, see if that helps. It did not. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to burn a 264 Diag chip and put it in here. So, you can also do this with a cartridge like you can with a dead test cartridge on a C64. But basically, I can just pull out these ROMs, uh, the kernel ROMs specifically, put this in, and then we'll get some diagnostics and see what that shows us. So here you can see the 264 Diag that I burnt. So I just made this, popped it in there. I went ahead and I pulled out the uh, high and low ROMs. Those are used for the built-in software. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just pull those out and get them out of the way. I might also pull out the basic ROM here just to get that out of the way in case one of those ROM chips are bad and they're pulling a line high or low could cause all kinds of problems. So we're going to go ahead and just pull all that out Turn it on and see what we get. So according to the documentation, this is this pattern, this checkerboard pattern that you're seeing here is supposed to change. And obviously it's not. So that is also very interesting. We're getting some blinks. I'm gonna guess it's a memory chip. So I think we'll start with chip eight. So that's the one that's blinking. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we'll start with that, pull it out, see if it tests good. If it does test good, then we know it's not the memory chip, even though this, um, this ROM thinks it is. 
and that could lead us in a little bit different direction. So let's go ahead and look at um, memory chip 8 and then see what we get. So what we have here is the memory chip that I pulled out and we're just going to run a test with it. So this is the Chip Tester Pro, I think it's what it's called. I'll put a link to where I got this um, from the folks at Backbit, but I'll put a link in the description below. So this is a pretty handy little tool. I've got another memory tester, the Retro Chip Tester Pro, which is a much bigger, more elaborate device. This one's pretty handy. It's small, easy to move around, um, and they all basically will test this chip. So I'm going to let it run here for a minute. I'm not getting any errors, which tells me there's something else going on on that board that's causing sort of bizarre memory problems. So yeah, we'll, we'll just have to keep looking around, but because it was reporting this memory chip is bad, and at least on this device is testing clear, it kind of points me in a little bit of a different direction. So let's see what else we can find out. Well, since we've got it apart, and since this component seems to fail a lot, I went ahead and pulled the PLA out and we're testing it. So far it looks good, um, but obviously when things fail it's, it's really hard to predict how they're going to fail exactly. But this is looking good, so there's something else going on when this is trying to address RAM that's causing it to freak out. Okay, so I went ahead and I fired it up with that RAM chip missing and it complains about something else, which is pretty interesting. So I'm wondering, since it acts like it's a memory problem and we're pretty confident it's not the PLA based on our testing, I wonder if these one of these multiplexers, um, looking online just a little bit about these, there's, there's a fair amount of folks talking about how the MOS version of these 74 LS, I think it was 257s, um, are not as reliable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and pop that memory chip back in and I'm going to pull one of the, actually I'll probably pull both of them and test them just to see if that's actually what's wrong with this thing. So let's do that. Okay, now we're making some progress here. So I pulled out uh, one of the multiplexers. I haven't pulled them both yet, but this one, as you can see here, failed. So the multiplexers are used to help address the memory chips. And so this one failing is, I guess, kind of a good sign because I think we're on to something. So I'm going to sock it and throw in a 74257, uh, which is essentially what this is. This is an MOS 7708, which is the same thing. So I'm going to go ahead, socket, put that in there, and then let's see if we get a little bit better results with our test. So as you can see here, I've got a whole tube full of multiplexers, so this isn't the first time I've seen a problem like this. Okay, I got everything put back together. I decided against putting sockets in just because I thought it looked a little funny to have one chip with a socket here and since I'm pretty confident the memory's good because it tested good I went ahead and just put everything back you can see I did replace the MOS multiplexer with this guy right here from my big tube of multiplexers I left this one alone just to see if everything works if it does we could call it done um, if I wanted to be proactive I could go ahead and just replace this one too that way it's got two brand new multiplexers in it and I, I may decide to do that or I may not let's just see what happens when we turn it on okay what we're seeing here looks a way better I can actually read some of that and this looks like as you just saw there very briefly the diagnostic ROM doing its thing. I'll have to go back and read the instructions uh, on the website about what all exactly it's doing and what the colors mean and and things like that but this is just significantly better than what we were seeing before. So what I might go ahead and do is just pop this out pop back in the original ROMs and see if we get a screen that looks reasonable but that's certainly looking good. Okay here we can see that I've replaced both of the multiplexers this guy here and this guy here so now it's got two shiny new multiplexers that were not made by MOS. So hopefully those won't be a problem anymore. And so there we go. I did not put in the 3-in-1 ROMs. I just put in the kernel ROM and the basic ROM, which is really all you should need in order to do anything useful here. But that certainly looks way better than it did before. So let's go ahead and pop back in just real quick that 3-in-1 software ROMs. Yeah, there we go. Cool. All right, so we're a lot closer. And then we'll put it back together, uh, run through that diagnostic ROM a little bit more with the keyboard plugged in, 
um, see what we get. But so far, we're looking a lot better. So here we got the keyboard pretty much all tore apart. And I will have to say, this is one of the more complicated Commodore keyboards that I've seen. I've never actually taken one completely apart like this, but it looked pretty dirty and gross. And if you've watched any of my videos, you know I like to try to clean things up a little bit if I'm working on them. Um, yeah, this thing's just got all kinds of parts to it. You've got these little pads like you would see on a remote control or a modern video game console. There's, those are used a lot. I don't know what they're called, but those are out there. You've got the little pads here. Let me grab one of these. So you got this little guy here. This is actually what touches the circuit board and makes the connection. You've got some very interesting looking springs, which to be honest, as I said, I've never taken one of these apart. But look at that spring. It's interesting. I've never seen one quite like it. I'm sure they're probably popular, but nothing that I've seen. So yeah, working on one of these, losing a spring, kind of would be bad. Um, you could probably make that using a small screen and uh, spring and sort of stretching it out, but that's that's just weird. Um, so anyway, kind of a complicated keyboard. Uh, the connector on the keyboard also kind of crappy. So the connector there you can see is kind of a very stiff ribbon type connector, but it's sort of an edge connector, not, not super durable. Um, probably not something that would last very long would be my guess if you were to disconnect it and connect it up a few times. In case you were ever curious, this is the inside of a plus four keyboard. After taking this keyboard on and off a couple of times, I've just decided this ribbon thing here is, is just horrible. So I'm going to replace this with a style of connector that you've seen probably on a Commodore 64 bread bin or a 128 or something. But yeah, this thing just has to go. This thing is, is just falling apart. Okay, so the keyboard connector that I put in was basically just a header at 90 degrees. You can see it right here. And I've got basically a connector that goes in like this. And it's a pretty tight fit, but that's okay. It does fit in there and it's nice and snug and it's not going to fall apart like that other connector did. And here's what it looks like on the keyboard side. I'll trim this up just a little bit, but basically I just ran the wires in there and soldered them into the board. And the connector fits right through the hole in the metal, so that's good. And I put this tape on here just to kind of reinforce this. This wire is not the stiffest, strongest stuff in the world. And if you've looked at a, the back of a Commodore 64, like a bread bin keyboard, they actually have tape on there to take the stress off of it as well. So I'll trim this back just a little bit so it looks a little bit nicer and gives us a little bit of room to move around when we put it on. But that should work a whole lot better than that other connector that was on there. Okay, we have everything put back together. So we've got the new power connector so that we can use a standard 64 power connector, replaced both of the multiplexers and replaced that keyboard cable completely so that it's a little bit easier and nicer and, and certainly much more durable. And we can see everything looks like it works good. So we'll test everything out. Looks pretty good. And we can even run the built-in software. So pretty cool. So as a final test, I'm going to pop in a cartridge that I've got. It's Pirate Adventure from Scott Adams. It's one of those old school text adventure games, the noun verb type games that are kind of frustrating and sort of hard to play, but I really get a big kick out of them. So uh, I'm going to play this for the next three or four hours just to make sure this computer is working as well as it should. So there we have it. We got this plus four all up and running, and I'm sure Simon will appreciate that. If you're interested, you can follow the Commodore Room on Instagram, where we post pictures and things of stuff that we're working on that normally doesn't make it to YouTube. Also, this coming April in 2024 will be the Indianapolis Classic Computer and Video Game Expo in Indianapolis. So I'll put a link to that below. And if you've got some time or you're in the area, you should come by. It'll be a lot of fun. I hope you had fun hanging out in the Commodore room today, and I hope you'll come hang out in the Commodore room again real soon.